So there's a backstory here. I reacted to the first episode of Vanderpump Rules. People in the comments said, you need to watch this Vile Files interview. First, I was shocked that the guy's name was Vile, and that was the name of his podcast, but whatever. I think he's actually a really good interviewer. But it's this interview with Schwartz and uh, Sandoval. So I go, okay, I'll just watch it, and then I'll do like an eight-minute reaction video. So I turn it on. Sandoval doesn't show up for like a half an hour. And Nick, the podcast host, is hammering Schwartz, which was boring, but also illuminating. And then Sandoval comes in and he is Sandoval unchecked. And I found myself being like, I need to, I need to say something. I need to say something. I need to say something. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do a moment by moment reaction. So what I thought was going to be an abbreviated sort of overview of the podcast is a now a long YouTube video. So buckle up. You're going to get all of my thoughts and they're snarky. I'm not super proud of how snarky they are. So, uh, what happens is I'm watching and I just get irritated with Sandoval and then more irritated and then more irritated. And then I just find myself yelling to the camera about Sandoval. So I'll be nicer next time. Oh, and before it starts, hit the like button, please. It's good for the YouTube algorithm. And I feel like I suffered for it. This is a lot of Sandoval that I had to listen to. Tom. Where two oh five, buddy. The f oh my god. Are you? We're on TST now. I'm Sandoval time. Yeah, I don't operate on time. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. First of all, Schwartz does operate on Tom Sandoval time. Otherwise, he wouldn't have the acronym for it. And I do think it's funny that Nick is not feeling the Tom Sandoval time dynamic. I don't think that Nick uh, is used to waiting on other people. I had a good trajectory going. I was happily married. My dream home in the valley. Business opportunities. After 2020. Things got weird. And what role do you think you played in that? In regards to... I, I, I've i read that Nick can be a jerk, but to me, like I like a direct and linear conversation versus someone that's pandering to their audience. So I'm sure Schwartz is uncomfortable, but it's but it's a, it's a valid question. <laughs> um, can you be more specific with the question? I'm just wondering, have you ever given much thought into the choices you've made that got you to where you are at today? For sure. You know, I take full accountability. Let's see how clear Schwartz can be about all the ways in which he's taken accountability. We were kind of like perfectly imperfect, you know. Um, what does that mean? It's like we were by no means a model relationship. I never, I don't think at any point, aside from maybe our wedding season. You see how he's just bouncing all over the place? It's because he so badly wants the audience to feel like he's got it together. But he's pandering to an audience that is too big. So he can't like settle into himself. It's like, how does how, how do I say this in a way that's going to make Katie happy? How do I make Nick happy? How do I make my fans happy? How do I not piss off Tom? Like he's just trying to do too much that I think he totally loses himself. If you could have changed anything about your behavior in your marriage, what mm. would you have changed? You can totally say nothing. No, 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 it's okay. Um, this is nice. This is nice, by the way, actually. Like that right there, that drives me nuts. He's sitting there being grilled by Nick. He clearly doesn't like it. He's clearly unable to settle into an answer. And his default response is, hey, this is this is nice, isn't it? Which is the opposite of what he actually thinks. I just wish he understood that by trying to please everybody, he looks exceptionally weak. And that's why he gets hammered by someone like Nick. And the audience. Peter Pan. Yeah. Fuck boy. Degenerate douches that many of your fans consider yeah. you to be. That is direct in that... I, um, do people walk off his, out of his podcast? Yeah, I just, okay. I feel like I'm being set up for failure with questions like this that. This is meant to be like, I, I get that all the time. It's yeah. like, oh, are you aware of what people think about you? Yeah. You know, or, you know, you're this or people think that. And I address those questions all the time. Like, like notice how Nick softened. As soon as Schwartz pushed back, Nick backs down a little bit and says, I don't think you're an asshole. I don't think that you're this Peter Pan douche. I, I know something, you know, I've, I've met Tom in different settings and I liked him there. Right. Like he definitely softens the second that Schwartz shows some semblance of a backbone. I just wish he would do that more frequently. Do you think I'm being unfair? No, I don't actually. I didn't mean to get defensive. Look, Schwartz is a nice guy, but he's a, he, he comes across like he's codependent, right? Even here when he's being scrutinized by Nick, he's clearly uncomfortable. He's desperate for Tom to show up. The second he can, he turns to Nick and goes, that wasn't an unreasonable question. I'm sorry that I got defensive. Like he just... He doesn't want Nick not to like him, and he'll do whatever it takes to make Nick comfortable, make Nick happy. 
be a good podcast guest. Like he'll do all those things because he's trying to please everybody else at his own personal sacrifice. Wow. Where the fuck are you? We're recording. Oh shit. It's 219. Oh my God. It is? Okay. All right. I'll be over. I'm, I'm coming over. Zero concern. Not, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Right? Zero concern. Oh my God, dude. <laughs> is this Thailand? Let's just take that down. Uh, <laughs> what? Come on. This this was a teachable moment. I don't think a lot of people are educated on that world, that industry. Actually, actually, it is a teachable moment. There's something about the two of them and their their teachable moment that rubs me wrong. I don't need to be, this is not a didactic opportunity for the two of them. And this idea that they're going to educate the audience, it just, I mean, I, they have a platform and it's I'm, it's good, but it's like, it feels very clearly like their effort to frame themselves in a positive light in reaction to a thing that they did that pissed off Lala. I get, I just, it just feels exceptionally insincere to me. Like exceptionally. That industry is rampant with corruption and uh, speed breeding, yeah. mistreatment of animals. Actually, you know, this, uh, uh, like, I'm actually, just, I'm, uh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm trying to frame the narrative here. The place we went to supposedly was highly uh, recommended Dude, and reputable. Beautiful. It was beautiful. And apparently they contributed significantly. And Vol and Schwartz are not on the same page here. <laughs> Schwartz is like, I learned a lot about the industry. They declom, they do speed breathing. And Sandoval's like, it was beautiful. I highly recommended. The boat ride out was wonderful. Uh, yes, the do teach to us, please. We like went along with like the tourists. Well, the, Dude. Whole, the whole trip was like, do as the locals do. I didn't go in there. Lying. I think everybody was more tiger. worried about like a tiger biting off my head. Your friends. Yes. Okay. The two of them are, it's just so contrived. It's contrived and they're so not on the same page. And they're just, they're both just desperately trying. It's like a gay, they're moving shells around trying to convince everybody they're a good person. The, the locals wanted us to do it. It was a beautiful place. Yeah, but we were plastered. We didn't know what we were doing. It was a teachable moment. I didn't go in there because, you know, I didn't want to get eaten by a lion. I I went in there, but everybody was really worried about me. We weren't worried about those tigers. What, who was worried about you? Okay, well, it's just my buddies. That, and it's just like a room full of feathers with these guys. And it's just like, if you would just be honest, just say, we didn't know, but we had a great time. We wouldn't do it again. Or... We disagree with Lala. We think the one that we went to was a reputable place and that it was safe for the Tigers. Whatever. Just say, speak your truth, boys. S speak your truth. You're two hours late to my podcast, by the way. You're like, I'll be I'll be there between 5.30 and uh, 6.30. You shut up at like 8.30. Tom, that's not true. This is a perfect example of whataboutism instead of addressing. I have, I have so many thoughts. First, Schwartz, I don't know what the story he's trying to create, how he's trying to position himself, but it's like this, like, pseudo intellectual fun guy or something like that where he's like this is a good another teachable moment about what about ism tom you should take accountability for being late whatever now he's not wrong but i would say the mechanism might be a little bit different it's possible i mean likely that tom felt like he had been slighted by nick and so this was this was a punishment this was consequencing nick for doing anything that could have possibly be more important than tom's podcast that's my guess that, that, or Tom is just really that out there and doesn't think that anybody else matters. And so it's fine to be late, whatever. That's also possible. I'm <laughs> sorry I'm late, Nick. Do you want to fucking rake me over the coals? I'm sorry I keep stopping it, but this is just, there's just so much content here. It's so rich. This is the exact same response that Tom had for Ariana when she was mad at him about having an affair. If you remember in the finale, he came downstairs and he was making breakfast. She was on the couch and she was angry at him. And Tom's response was to be like, what, you're just gonna be over there and you're just gonna sit and be angry at me? You're just gonna be mean to me all the time? You're just gonna be really aggressive all the time? I said, I was sorry, what's wrong? It's like this weird sort of shift where he is blaming everybody else for being angry at him for his behavior. That response is like a central defense mechanism for Tom. Uh, do you want anything? For you to die. Well, that's inevitable. So this guy has an affair, then he walks through the house and you'll notice that he has the attitude, right? Like she's pissed, sure, but he's going to walk in and be moody 
as though it's her problem, as though like she's making it uncomfortable, as though she's being unreasonable. That is gaslighting, right? He is making everybody around him feel like their response is unreasonable, like, like their perception of reality is not accurate. How was Thailand? It was a great spiritual reset. I feel refreshed and excited about life like I haven't been in uh, quite some time. I had some sort of figurative rebirth. Does that sound like malarkey? In what way? Yes, it does. I don't think that you are, you know, a, a phoenix rising from the ashes. All of a sudden, <laughs> Schwartz is Mr. Self-Aware, Mr. Mr. Learned. Give me a break, man. My senses are sharpened. My ambition is back. So what do you think is going to be different now? Nick's a good interviewer. Schwartz is over here saying, I've had this rebirth. It's a spiritual awakening. I'm motivated now. And Nick's like, yeah, 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 yeah. What are you going to do different? These guys drive me, the two of them drive me nuts. Feel like I have clarity of vision. My appetite for life is back. I just, I don't know, man. It was so nice, like, seeing you, like, in the pool, in the infinity pool, just, like, to me, that was worth it all. Yeah, overall, I think it was a good thing. It raised awareness for a questionable industry and, uh, right? What? Bringing it back to the, the Tiger King incident. They are so far from viewing this the same. And Schwartz is like tap dancing around, trying to say it's a rebirth and an educational moment. And Sandoval's like, huh? What, what are you talking about? I loved gazing at you in the pool. These guys. Are you ready to protect someone's heart? Yes, of course I am. Unfortunately, being vulnerable in, in a situation like got me to throw you know, logic and everything out the window and people's feelings. I can't, first of all, I can't tell if he's doing the same like pseudo cry thing right now or what's going on, but he's, I think he's being, this is the, <laughs> this is the vulnerable and deep Tom. And I can't tell, is he suggesting that because he was vulnerable, I don't get it because he was vulnerable, his vulnerability led him to hurt Ariana. Is that the logic that it was, it was the depth of his vulnerability? I've learned so much like what like i uh, she was you know she was like i don't know what my life will be without you know, you know all this stuff and like i could have i i should have i don't know man i don't know dude but he learned so much he learned the most what did you learn uh well i you could you, i could take a page out of schwartz's book with katie you know ariana was like Dude, I don't know, man. Dude, I don't know. To not ever be in a nine-year fucking relationship and end it that way. All right. Jokes aside, uh, I do think that he is sorry. I do think that he believes that he won't do it again. I do think that he regrets what he did. I guess what I question is his capacity to maintain that mindset in the future. So the answer for me to Nick's question, I think probably the answer for most people is, no, I would never want my sister or friend to date Tom Sandoval because I don't trust his ability to regulate his emotions. I don't trust his ability to put somebody else's needs first. I think that he is, I think he struggles to, to control himself. And so he's sitting here in a very earnest way saying, fucked up. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. But it doesn't feel to me like he's gained the skills required to actually like interrupt that behavioral pattern. I, I would, I, my guess would be, it'd be very easy for him to get smitten with somebody and love hard and re-engage in, in a very similar way. I think he convinces himself that, you know, that it, that it, it's okay because of this reason or that reason. Kind of identify those triggers. Why in those critical moments did they choose one path versus the other? Let me respond to what Nick said there because I think he's right, but I don't love how it was positioned. So so he's right that if there's ever any negative behavior and you look at it and go, man, I wish I didn't do that, it's important to figure out, well, what is the underlying mechanism that led to that behavior? You know, are, are you cheating because you saw your parents cheat or are you cheating because you're angry at your spouse? Are you cheating because you have, you know, your own self-doubt and you wanted to feel good in the moment? What, whatever it is, it's good to identify like what the driver was. 
What I don't love is that when you say it that way, and I think when Tom hears it, Tom thinks that's my reason, that's my excuse. And so I'm not really accountable. The truth is when anybody has an affair, the reason why they're having the affair is because they want to. At every moment in all of your behavior, you are making a decision. And in that moment, Tom chose, and in Tom's case, over the course of seven or nine months, whatever it was with Raquel, Tom chose his own desire over the well-being of Ariana. At the end of the day, it is a decision that he made. So what I would worry about Tom doing is going, look, I did it because I was mad at, because we weren't having sex. So for that reason, it's kind of okay, right? I just need to find a partner that will have sex with me more often and then we're good. And it's like, no, no, no. You need to recognize that you were frustrated in the relationship and maybe you handled the relationship incorrectly. You should have talked to her. You could have broken up with her, whatever. And your behavior, your inability to make a good decision is a problem. And for that, you are responsible. I will say on a positive note, so many people have come to me and confided that they were in a similar situation because of Scandaval. You know, they they had like an awakening. I'm talking like hundreds of people. Uh, Schwartz is a good guy, but he is like trying so hard to spin this into like, look, it was really we were doing God's work with that whole Scandaval thing. You know how many you know how many relationships were saved by Tom's sacrifice with Ariana. I had such low self worth, and when this whole Rachel Raquel thing happened, logic went out the window. So there's Tom's excuse. That's, it was, I was, I had a, I had low self-esteem and I was a slave to my emotions. And by the way, I'm not here to be a Sandoval apologist behind closed doors. You say all the right things, but like, sucked, I, I know as a dear friend of yours, you regret everything you did on a deep level. Thank you, Schwartz. The non Sandoval apologist. Honestly, it is an unhealthy relationship because Schwartz is so motivated to protect Tom. Like, and, and to Nick's point, at his own personal sacrifice. Like this relationship with him consistently puts Schwartz in a bad position where he is out there sort of representing Tom because Tom is not able, at least in the public spotlight, to communicate in a way that is thoughtful and believable. And so you've got Schwartz over there doing his best to tap dance around. It's just like a disaster with these two. Guys, if you want me to be King honest, for Ariana. Throughout our relationship, talk to me like I was down here all the fucking time. My way of acting out. So it was payback, another excuse. So it wasn't about the sex, it wasn't about his self esteem. It was about making Ariana suffer for her egregious behavior. And somebody like Raquel, somebody who's tw in her 20s, like doing the getting whipped cream fucking. Bikini thing, like like in Varsity Blues, like I mean, it's just like smokescreen here. Oh, she was hot in the whipped cream bikini, just like Varsity Blues. You've been there. My self esteem was low. It was pushed lower by Ariana. I, I just I, I couldn't control my emotions. I just it, this might be construed as you saying she made me cheat. That's no, not, that's not it. what she you're. You don't want to be that guy. That. All right, I feel like I have to say this here because it's just it's like it's so clear. And I can't diagnose from afar. I, I don't know Tom. I've never interacted with him. And I'm only reacting to what I've seen on, you know, Bravo and what I've seen on a, a podcast. But he, what you're seeing here is like, it, it just fits so cl clearly with the diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. So I just want to sort of explain that a little bit. So in order to have a personality disorder, you have to have a pervasive pattern, meaning you have to show up this way in multiple areas of your life. It can't just be with your romantic partner. So you have to do things where you're sort of mistreating your friends, you're mistreating your romantic part partners, you're mistreating your kids if you have them, maybe your parents, coworkers, whatever. It has to be all parts of your life. And if you look at Tom, the way he's approached this podcast, the way he approaches his friend, Tom Schwartz, the way he approached Ariana, the way he's responding to the criticism, like it, this is a this looks like a pervasive pattern. There's also like the the, the sort of the the diagnostic check boxes you want to hit for narcissism, you know, include the lack of empathy, right? He's not saying I feel really bad because I hurt Ariana. What he's saying is 
you don't know how bad it was for me. There is a delusion about how important he is, right? He rolls onto the podcast late, no big deal, right? There's this inflated sense of who he is. He doesn't have any ability to understand the perspectives of others, right? When he walks in with the picture that Lala tweeted about with the tiger and he's like, you know, look at this cool picture of me, not able to connect the fact that that's what people were really upset about. There's a, there's a part of him, which is so self-oriented that he just simply can't see the world around him. It's not that he's trying to be mean. It's that he doesn't recognize that he's impacting people around him this way. It's just all about him. Dude, she literally, you know, was part of a cheating scandal and now has everything going for her. Speaking of that lens being off, right? He's like, she was part of a cheating scandal and now everything's going for her as though she was actively involved in Tom's decision to cheat with Raquel. She was cheated on by you, buddy. It's not, this is not like you both did the same thing and why is she doing so much better than you? How, Tom, do you think you can get to a place of peace? Like when I went back home for Christmas, my mom gets a, a Douglas fir, a real Fraser fir like tree. And there's this like little yellow ornament. It looked like Tweety Bird. I used to love Tweety Bird when I was a kid. What is he talking about? Like, oh God. She's been a little spiteful. She's been a little spiteful. She's been a <laughs> yeah, little fucking like, reactive. She's entitled to her spite. But... No, no, no. But like 10 months later, let it go. You're not going to believe it. 10 months after I had my nine month affair, she still is spiteful to me. It's ridiculous. She looked fabulous at the Emmys. Should she we did. talk about the Emmys? We can. Yeah. I mean, we could pivot. <laughs> Towards again, let's pivot to something nice. She's had a glow up. You see how beautiful she looked at the Emmys? Like this, these drive me nuts. It just drives, nothing is sincere. Nothing is sincere. Like how have you made an effort to put others' consideration before yourself? I okay. told my friends to uh, please speak up if I'm ever being a f dick. I, I do think that that is a good answer from Tom. Like that is a, that is a viable, there's a lot, there's more to be done. There's more work to be done, but that is a, a good behavioral strategy is to tell people around you, Hey, when I, when I act that way, I want you to, to hold me accountable. Tell me that I'm doing it. Scenario again, where you're, you I'll know, never feelings. never be in this scenario again. <laughs> well, maybe just. Maybe we have to do like interviews, uh, confessionals and all that shit. And I wanted to wait until after we were done doing all of those before I told her. We're back to protect. I was protecting her by not telling her. Aren't I a good guy? And you go hard to the paint and say, but she would have, I did this for her and she did this to me. And it always in comes what, across in what, aspect, at, in what aspect, Nick? First of all, Nick is 100% right. And I love the fact that Tom's response is like, what are you talking about? When, it, when Nick is pointing out exactly, like exactly what Tom just did. He just said, I would never do this. And then the next thing out of his mouth was, I had to do it because I was protecting her because you know reality TV. She wouldn't have been able to go up there and talk about what happened six months ago with a clear mind. If I told her that is exactly what he did. And that is exactly what Nick pointed out. A hundred percent. Responding to you. If you would just say, I what do you want up, me to say, Nick? Don't, you. don't say the other stuff. And now per the Tom Sandoval script, now we're going to attack the person that's holding us accountable. At one point, Ariana and I were like best fucking friends, best fucking friends. And that time went away. Like it just, it just went away. You're just watching someone that has a limited sense of self-awareness, someone who lacks self-control, motion regulation skills. And you're just seeing, because of the questions are so pointed, he is just demonstrating that he has no ability to like thoughtfully think through what happened and, and how he behaved, which is why everybody's looking at him being like, you don't get it, man. Cause I, I really don't think he understands the impact he's had. I don't think he gets it. And I don't think he's done any work to really understand what, what the mechanism for him. I don't think he's done that work. And that's why he comes across so unhinged here. Are you still in therapy? Yeah.
I finally, finally am like starting to grieve the loss of my best friend, my brother Ali. Okay. I cried That's... the piece so fucking hard last night. Like my my eyes were bloodshot. Like I You never want to evaluate how somebody grieves, right? We all grieve differently and you go through different phases when you're, you know, different different emotional experiences when you're grieving. And so I don't have any kind of appraisal of his grief process. My concern, what, what, what I'm reacting to or what I don't, didn't love about that interaction was the, like the pointing to look how painful it's been for me, right? Like there's a, there's a look at me, um, vibe there. I cried my eyes out. Like my, my eyes were bloodshot. I didn't sleep last night. That's, oh, that's the reason why I was late. I, it's like this. I want to demonstrate for the world how much pain I'm in. It, it, that's how it feels versus him saying, him saying, I'm working through the grief, you know, losing my friend Ali, but like not needing to be provocative, not, not needing to be demonstrative about it. There's a, this, is this a weird sort of, again, self-interested vibe for me, but it could be that I'm just, you know, I've been stuck here listening to this guy <laughs> yammer on for so long. Maybe I'm jaded. You know, you've done some st stupid shit as I have. Dude, I suck, Do you think uh, no, you don't like, suck? Don't, 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 Dude, you got don't, not with the pity party. Does that feel manipulative <laughs> to anybody else but me? He just shows up as I fucked up. I'm so sorry. And then it, actually it was Ariana's fault. And then it was like, I was grieving for my lost friend. And then it's like, you know, actually you don't, she didn't sleep with me for so long. And then it was actually, I'm really terrible. I'm a horrible, you know, I really suck. And it's like this, like up and down up. And it's just, Again, it's just like a shell game because he just can't say what he actually feels. He can't actually reflect on it. We still have toxic texting office hours. Uh, you want to give someone else some relationship advice? Are you up for that, Sandoval? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm so there, this, all right, I'm going to bow it here. This is a lot of Tom and Tom, and I think I, I've had my fill. Tell me in the comments if something egregious happens, something incredible happens even. Uh, in the texting office hours, and I'll react to that last little bit later. But I think, I think I've had enough. Uh, that was a banger. I thought, what an interesting podcast. I thought Nick did really well. I thought Tom and Tom were, you know, they were them in all of their glory. Uh, so I thought you. So I hope you thought it was interesting. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe, all those things. It's good for the YouTube algorithm. Um, thanks for listening and I will see you next week. <laughs>